thank you all so much for staying. I'm going to bring up our Q&A moderator. Uh, <laughs> in the hall for. Sorry. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Kimbara Balfour. I'm going to bring our stars up. I know everyone's probably feeling a little bit time to decompress after the film. So we'll just bring everyone up and then we'll have a little Q&A for about 15 minutes. Um, and I will open the uh, questions up to the audience. So at the end, if you want to ask a question, I just have to let you know I am filming on an iPhone, possibly for YouTube. So if you ask a question, your voice is being recorded. Um, so, let's have everyone come up. Danny, Houston, director. <laughs> sit down. Simon Astaire, who wrote the book and the screenplay. And Peter Raven, whose beautiful music is just such a beautiful addition to the film. Come and sit down. incredibly respectful uh, film. I was actually saying uh, a father, a, a girl in my school, her father died in the Lockerbie disaster. Um, and I can only say that to see how much those family were affected and what a tribute you have done, what a tribute you have made for all those people who suffered. So I think we should just all have a, a moment of silence and thought as we speak just for all the people who were affected in that disaster. So congratulations, an incredible film. I've seen it uh, in so many different ways. I wanna ask you, Danny, first, how did this story come to you and how did you choose that this was the right thing for you? Uh, well, my, my dear friend, Simon Astaire, um, gave me the screenplay and I, uh, what I liked about it in particular was um, uh, but it was a simple story, really. In essence, it's a man who loses a photograph, um, or maybe it's stolen, and, and what that photograph uh, means to him. Um, and then the, the the tapestry that Simon created in the screenplay, the the uh, the way that the film is told um, out of chronology, um, and um, as we as we learn um, through the memory of the man. What the photograph symbolizes. Simon, you uh, wrote the book and then wrote the screenplay. How did you um, how did you bring this to Danny? How did that come about? This relationship. I know you're friends, but that doesn't always mean that people work together. <laughs> um, yeah, we're all friends. But, uh, because I immediately thought that he could first. I thought he could direct the movie. I just thought he had that sensitivity of the subject. Um, I have great respect um, for his talent, and uh, I didn't think of anyone else, to be perfectly honest. So was, as I put the full stop or the end or whatever you write in the li final line, um, I sent it to him. I sent him to him, I remember, on a lunch, and he rang me back that afternoon, and he was clearly very, very moved by it. And uh, we took it from there. And what was it about the Lockerbie disaster specifically that that you wanted to cover and feature in the way that you, in what you, what you wrote? Well, actually, I wrote about a father losing his son. So I wanted to write the book. I wrote about, in a way, the greatest grief that I could experience or that anyone could experience. So that was the starting point. And I um, had a neighbour. Uh, at the time, who um, who I didn't know very well, I sort of said hello to him in the morning, and he passed me. And then that particular morning, on the December the twenty first, nineteen eighty eight, uh, he passed me, and I said Happy Christmas to him. And he said, Oh, I'm off to New York to see my girlfriend tonight on the Pan Am flight at six o'clock. So I said, Oh, well, have a great time, and I'll see you after Christmas. So that's really where the idea of that came from because of course he never came back. Wow. wow, I did love in the film, um, I love how fleeting all the moments are, and yet they amass to something so important and so special, and it really is a reminder. I mean, the thing when you're clinking the glass of keep it in the present, enjoy the present, but this film really is a reminder for all of us, that is all we have. 
and as fleeting as some of the moments of life seem, they are, they are it and they are wonderful. And I really, really got that from the film. I love the pace. Peter, your music really lends itself so beautifully to this story. It's uplifting and yet incredibly sad. And I think it really matches the, the themes of grief so well. And yet one feels so happy to be alive at the end of it. How did you uh, collaborate with Danny as the director on this? And was he easy to collaborate with? <laughs> He was um, great to collaborate with. It was a, a, a true collaboration. Um, uh, there was, I, I think the, the, the way that Danny captures time past, time present, time future, all in the same moment is pretty, pretty extraordinary. And so musically and editorially, we, we wrestled with that. There were some difficult scenes to score, for sure. But in terms of the kind of overriding emotion, it strikes me that once once you have love, even in grief, that love lasts forever. And we see that, we hear that, and we feel that, we read that. And music, some of the music, it, it just attempts to feel just that, that love lasts forever. And I think that's something incredible about grief and about love. So, so while some of the music is, wrestling with the the trauma um, and all the all the layers of, of of this man who is who through morse code driving to 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 lockerbie and all of these these just extraordinary i think extraordinary scenes of, of of being in the moment but but a story told back and yet looking forward at the same time it's 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 that's really being in the present it's being everywhere and um and I think just there, there is there is hope and there is love and um, there is a lightness in in this relationship with father and son. They they have a lovely relationship that's captured in the drive. That's captured, um, and and I think the music just tries to be with them some of the time. Well, it certainly does, Peter. Um, <clears throat> when I first spoke to Peter. I was saying, you know, memory, memory is like it's like boxes, like little boxes, and you open them up, and then sometimes the memories come out, but there are gaps in between the different boxes. Sometimes we have, we, I went on and on and on, I don't know really exactly what I was saying. Peter, I could see that Peter was looking at me with slightly concerned. And, <laughs> and so the, the first theme, uh, he wrote, he wrote it for a music box, and he played it to the, and, you, and I could hear the, I could hear the, the, the wheels turning. I could hear, I could hear the instrument, um, and um, and we kind of kept to that, didn't we, Peter? We we uh, 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 you could hear you can hear the you can hear the keys hitting. You can hear the the, the, the piano. You can hear the instruments breathe. Um, and uh, sorry. Well, I was just going to say that that the collaboration. One of the best examples of the collaboration is that as Danny was able to shoot more work after he'd spent quite a while in the edit and deciding, deciding how to go from there, he, he called me up one day from, from Lockerbie and he had on his phone the theme I'd written and he'd seen some of the shots which we end up finishing the film with. And you heard it and I had no idea. I didn't think that was gonna go anywhere towards the end of the film at that point. It was just something I'd written and it was part, becoming part of our work. And you kind of directorially put it all, it, it, all together in your head in that moment. So that's that's a real example of a collaboration. What I really loved as well is is um, I'm sure lots of people have commented on this is that you're dealing with something that could potentially be hugely full of loud bangs, explosions, uh, bright lights. It isn't. The archive footage you use is is as authentic as it gets, and you don't really go further than that. And the way you weave the music in with that, I found it. It's still so. Um, it's kind of surreal, and I suppose your character, for anyone who wasn't involved, it's such a surreal thing. Even now I look and go, I can't, you can't believe that happened. But you don't drum it in, and I love that. Danny, just tell us how difficult or how easy was it for you to direct yourself? Uh, well, it was, a, it was a slightly schizophrenic experience. <laughs> um, uh, one of the reasons I cast myself was because I knew I was available. <laughs> And maybe I'd arrive on time. Um, 
and um, and that's total truth. Uh, um, and and I, it was because there were I wanted to shoot the film in different seasons. So I, I, I well I started uh, uh, filming uh, with a Canon still camera, and I started filming the Christmas lights uh, because it was Christmas, and I wanted to take advantage of of that. Uh, and uh, and that really started to, to uh, influence the style of the film uh, because every time we reached another uh, another time period, um, I shot with different equipment. So the uh, the kids in the park are 60 millimeter. Uh, the stuff in the bookstore is a, is a Panasonic camera, but it's, it's digital, but it's Panasonic. Um, and uh, there are all these all, all these different formats that that created this tapestry that, that Simon had, had written without me having to use place cards or or uh, inf uh, inform the audience where where we were. Uh, hopefully, the audience uh, start to get into it and and, and understand uh, where they are <coughs> to the point that. That as the story progresses, uh, when we use the news footage, um, hopefully again we don't have to point it out, um, and it doesn't interrupt uh, the emotional connection that you're having with the piece. And I also think, uh, oh, I didn't really. There's no well, there's no ego. I was going to say with the whole thing of seeing you in it, there is no ego. Although you may joke about that and say that. Well, yes, no, I, I like to say that this is a. It's, it's a. Well, it is. It's a small. Uh, Experimental film, uh, uh, but I, I like to, I, I like to say uh, that it's a rather h humble film. But then I realize I can't because it's a close-up of me from beginning to end. <laughs> 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 um, but yes, uh, the directing it was extremely exhilarating. Uh, acting in it uh, was difficult. It was a, it was a difficult. Uh, uh, it's, it's a difficult character to bring back home. Simon, you I know you opened this in the Edinburgh Film Festival, and uh, Alistair. Stuart. Stuart, the newsreader who we hear on the film, he actually moderated with you, which I think is such a lovely thing. What, just so we all know, we all want to spread the word to all our friends, where's, where's the, the film is just opened on Amazon, just remind us where it's on. Uh, B Bill, it's... it's uh... All cable, satellite outlets, Amazon, iTunes, Vudu, everywhere. As everywhere of today. Digitally, as of today, uh, yes. for sale, for rent. <laughs> And we're in, we're in one theater nationwide <laughs> for one week, um, which is you know it's 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 been an incredible journey, hasn't it, Simon? And, and uh, um, yeah, we're de delighted that Freestyle has picked us up, and uh, and with with digital platform, you really can reach a wide a wide audience with with a f film as small as this. I'm going to open up to the audience. We don't have microphones for you, so if you're brave enough, please just raise your voice. And, um, okay, gentleman on the left, we have one. Uh, Danny Simon, Peter, well done. I thought it was an extraordinarily moving and compelling film. I'm very interested, Danny, to hear you talk a little bit about the visual style of it. It was really strikingly visual, and this story wouldn't automatically lend itself to that. You could do a much more straightforward uh, treatment of, of a story of grief and loss. Can you talk to that a little bit, please? Yeah, I mean, m most of it, as, as I said earlier, most of it started by necessity. Um, it wasn't a stylistic choice. And um, uh, after, after the Q&A yesterday, I was thinking about other examples of that. And there's, you know, films like Rome Open City, where you have, where you have Rossellini using the short ends of magazines and stuff like that. I mean, that's kind of, when you have no money, uh, you have to come up with, uh, with, 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 not, I mean, we had some money, but, but when you have very little money, you have to come up with, with good ideas to, to make it work. Um, and there, um, you know, there's, there's a lot of, there are a lot of silences in the film, which from, from a sound point of view, the silences for me are the loudest moments in the film. Um, and um, and so, so there's the, the, sound, the sound effects and the imagery. Uh, um, I think there was a certain discipline to using 60 millimeter, you know, the mag runs out, uh, you can only position the camera, uh, you're not shooting from the hip as you are with, with, with digital. Um, so there, there were different, uh, stylistic influences that were that, that were creating uh, a different approach um, and a uh, different type of lighting and different different type of equipment different you know, different different movements different sizes of ca the cameras a different size etc thank you 
I wanted to also ask Danny, how do you, th how has your father's work influenced you with your, with your, now you're directing as well as acting, how has his influence shown? Well, my, my father's work has, has influenced me completely. Um, and um, a great, great uh, uh, filmmaker. Um, and I, I had the privilege of walk, watching him work. I used to watch dailies with him, rushes a lot, uh, with him a lot. Um, and uh, depending on the country, uh, he'd, he'd have a different drink. <laughs> um, in this particular situation, I was, I was in Mexico, and he was drinking Cuba Libre. And, um, and I, I, I made him a Cuba Libre, and he said, no, 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 the, the, the Coke should only color the rum. <laughs> oh, I'm so sorry. Right? Anyway, so I, I, I prepared the drink correctly, and he, and he, and he looked at me and said, Danny, do you want to you direct the title sequence? I said, wow, yeah, I'd love to. And there were these paper mache dolls from the Day of the Dead. Um, and um, under the volcano, Malcolm Lowry, so Day of the Dead dolls. And um, um, I filmed them with, uh, with a snorkel camera. And uh, I was able to move around the dolls and give the dolls movement, because otherwise the dolls were static. Uh, but, um, and then the other thing I remember on the, on the volcano, he said, Dan, Danny, Danny, come over here. Let me show you something. I said, what, 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 what is it? It's a steady cam. <laughs> I don't have to lay any tracks. <laughs> um, and, um, and he was, and he, he and uh, Orson Welles, I mean, we just saw the other side of the wind uh, uh, re released. These guys were pushing uh, 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 the technique, and, and they were innovative and rebellious, um, and and that's that's really what uh, what gave me the the uh, the recklessness, I suppose, in in, 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 in approaching this. And my dear dear friend Bernard Rose, um, who I've made four films with, um, who is unapologetic, like a punk rocker man he just goes there and he does it he doesn't wait for anybody to tell him whether he can do it or not he just he rolls up his sleeves and, and makes his films and that also inspired me thank you uh gentleman on the right so how can you talk about the schedule and how long it took to take them took to make the movie uh yeah you, and just shooting and then also both yeah well we actually didn't uh, shoot that many days i think maybe 20 days in total uh, if that. But over a uh, long period of time? Or no, over a, over a long period of time. So the Christmas lights, I guess, was before we had financing. We were, we were <laughs> three or four months went by over that, and then, then, uh, and then we shot uh, the, the, uh, the scenes inside the house, which are actually Simon's, it's actually Simon's father's house, who had recently passed, um, and had a very much a feeling of the period, and, and, and um, Ghostly. Um, and um, then we stopped completely um, and uh, waited for the summer and shot the scenes in the, with 60 millimeter in the, in the, in the park. Um, and then I uh, we put the film, to, we started editing the film, um, and uh, Peter started working on the music. And then with Alexa, uh, um, I shot the final sequence um, in Lockerbie. Uh, so that was over a span of about nine months right. with 20 days shooting. Great. <laughs> Simon, did you have an idea of locations when you were writing the script? Yeah. Yes, most of it shot four blocks from where I was born. And literally, it was amazing. There was one moment where um, I, I wrote, I remember I wrote it on, in a coffee bar on, on Sunset Boulevard. And um, I thought, where is Tom going to think he's found the photograph and <clears throat> approach the woman and try and snatch it? And I knew the church, St. Luke's Church, which was my local church. And next to St. Luke's Church, there's a little park there, exactly where it was shot. And the day that um, they were shooting it, I went towards the park and this policeman stopped me. And he said, you can't go in there. And I said, why? And he said, because they're shooting a movie. Danny, Danny Houston's shooting this movie and it's very, you can't go in there. And I went, but I wrote it. <laughs> it's my park. <laughs> so yes, I was very specific of exactly where. And we did, we, we, didn't we? We followed it 
really has, has risen. I, I paid that policeman. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what, to stop me getting in <laughs> I, I was actually, uh, I was pushing my son, 11 month old, in that park literally two weeks ago. It's, it's such a special corner of London. It's so nice how you've captured it. I think we have to wrap up. Is it what, any other questions? Um, we do have to wrap up because they have other films coming in. Shock horror. Gentlemen here, and then we'll. What's next, up. Danny? Are you available? <laughs> I'm available, sir. Yeah, I've got. I've got. You know, I just finished Yellowstone the series and yeah. it's a succession. Um, I actually, I actually have uh, this. Uh, really terribly boastful. Please forgive me. Uh, I actually, but it's just too fun in comparison. I actually have a film that was number one for the last two two weekends, a real popcorn shoot 'em up, uh, uh, enter entertain entertaining film called Angel Has Fallen, and I just love the idea that I have this film playing here in one in in, in one theater. It's just perfect, perfect for me. Yeah. Um, we are going to uh, wrap up now. I just want to shout out the power of social media. Danny's on Instagram, Simon and Peter's on Instagram. If anyone wants to share the message, do so. We really want everyone to see this as much as, as we have enjoyed it. Um, and thank you all so much for coming and well done you guys, it's the best. Thank you, thank you.